So, this week we are discussing about protein dynamics um, which can be proved by NMR spectroscopy. So, in last lectures I, I discussed why dynamics, why dynamics is important, what all methods are there to measure dynamics and why NMR based dynamics. So, we will continue uh, our discussion uh, for the NMR based dynamics, how we can do the experiments. So, typically we discuss that we measure the spin dynamics, spin relaxation rate by carrying out two dimensional heteronuclear experiments such as HSQC, heteronuclear single quantum coherence or heteronuclear multiple quantum coherence experiment and uh, then uh, we can like uh, measure the 13 C or N 15 relaxation. Proton relaxation are uh, rather complicated, so they are not directly measured in protein NMR. Uh, so, typical scheme for 2D heteronuclear relaxation measurement is something like this. We have to start with a preparation state where we start preparing a desirable coherence like we start with proton transfer to N15 and there we, we introduce the variable delay of various length which actually captures the auto or cross uh, relaxation rate. After this we introduce a T1 period which indirectly encodes the frequency such as N15 or, or 13 C. So, that is a T1 period. After T1 period we transfer the magnetization to proton because we are going to detect on proton. So, finally transferring the magnetization back to proton and acquiring on proton while decoupling the heteronuclei like a 13 C or N15. And then um, after acquisition there is a delay period that D1 period and this D1 period ensures that our magnetization are again back to the Z direction before we start the next scan. So, that then we go back and start the next scan. So, typically this is the experiment that is done preparation T1 delay here we are encoding that uh, like a, in case of say T1 experiment we will be uh, encoding here longitudinal relaxation rate. So, delay T then followed by a T1 period indirectly frequency encoding transferring the magnetization on proton and finally acquiring it. That is a typical acquisition period that we have in the 2D. So, if you look at the pulse sequence of a longitudinal relaxation um, which is like a T1 relaxation T1 or R1 relaxation rate longitudinal relaxation. This is the kind of pulse sequence that we used. This is water flip back sensitivity enhanced T1 HSQC experiment. So, um, like water flip back uh, is required for suppressing water as you know in protein the concentration of protein is typical of few hundred micromolar or maximum 1 or 2 millimolar, but the water concentration is very high. So, we need to kill the water, water is generally 55 molar. So, we have to kill the water and that is how all the protein experiments in uh, in code like has this water flip back or water suppression schemes. Here is also water flip back experiment. So, if you look at typically we are starting here with a inept transfer we are coming on, on the um, nitrogen. Then here we are encoding the T1 right that is a T1 variable and here is frequency encoding and after that we are transferring back to proton and then we are doing the sensitivity enhanced. Finally, we are acquiring on proton while decoupling on nitrogen. These are a gradient pulse for coherence selection as well as uh, killing the undesired magnetization. So, this is the T1 period. This is being introduced to measure the trans uh, longitudinal relaxation rate in T1 pulse sequence. So, what, what we have typically? 1 180 degree inversion pulse right. So, that inverts the magnetization from Sz direction to minus Sz direction, Sz direction to minus Sz that is the inversion pulse right. And then this T period is allowed that, that is given magnet a magnetization to come back to the Z direction. So, we first we invert it and then allow magnetization. So, once we invert like this 
it does the precessional motion come back to rigid direction. So, this T period is basically varied and that is what measures. So, you start with a minus z direction and then with a different T period we are measuring the how the intensity is changing and coming back to equilibrium. So, that is what you measured m z at any point T is equal to m z of equilibrium 1 minus 2 into e to the power T divided by T 1. So, this is the rate and this T uh, which was which was there if I use the eraser here. So, he, if you look at here we have a t period that t period essentially this t period is the um, time period that we are giving and t 1 rate is the uh, rate like uh, this is the t time delay and t 1 is the rate. Right. So, a 90 degree pulse creates the observable transverse magnetization for detection that is why we apply a 90 degree and then 41 measurement this relaxation block is inserted in the sensitivity enhanced sensitivity enhanced HSQC experiment. Okay. So, uh, so that is that is how we do the experiment. So, let me summarize again we start with proton magnetization transfer to nitrogen. Uh, then we invert it and then allow a T1 period, then T1 period to create an observer uh, sorry to, to spin to relax and then we apply a 90 degree pulse which creates the observable transfer of magnetization and transfer back to proton detect the proton that is what essentially we are doing in this T1 experiment. So, in terms of product operator if you look at we start with a z direction H z which with a 90 degree pulse converted to H uh, minus H y. Then we are evolving under coupling and finally transferring back magnetism to the nitrogen N y. Then we introduce the T 1 time period here and finally it goes to some eta of N z. Now, this factor eta is a T dependent time dependent of magnetization signal amplitude. So, you can write this factor is equal to 1 minus 2 e to the power T that time we are giving and T 1 rate right or in simplified version 1 minus 2 e to the power minus T R 1. So, 1 by T 1 1 by T 1 is R 1 that is the rate and this is the time. Okay. So, this gives us so the in intensity that has decayed essentially gives us how much uh, the magnetization is, is, is changing and that is how we measure it. So, this is the conceptual framework for doing the T 1 experiment. Let us go how we set up the experiment <coughs> and how we process the data in this case. So, we start with a usual stuff right we take a protein sample whatever concentration you can afford take it about 500 microliter at 10 percent of D2O this is for locking. Then you do the sample height adjustment. So, like in a typical NMR to you you have to have something around 2.1 cm or uh, around 20 or 21 mm height adjustment. Then you tune the magnet, shim the magnet, set the one frequency or one setting that usual stuff in any protein NMR experiment that we do we are going to do with it. Then we determine the 90 degree pulse that we calibrate it for transmitter and decoupler and we choose the spectral window how much we want to keep for our, our um, typical protein that we have. So, here generally you want to 0 to 12 ppm and here say 100 to 130 ppm should be fine for recording an N15 HSQC experiment. Now, important point because we are doing relaxation experiment. So, typically we have to set a D 1 which will be 5 times of T 1. So, typically setup of D 1 is recycle delay should be 1.5 to 2 second and generally uh, we have to signal average good right. So, so we have like a certainly number of a scans should be 4 or 8. Now, in in the experiment different T point we are recording right different time where the spin is relaxes, relaxing. So, we need typically of 8 to 12 T delay which you can range from 5 millisecond to 1.5 second for nitrogen 15. So, first 
2D experiment we do with 5 millisecond, then 50 millisecond, 100 millisecond, 500 millisecond, 800 millisecond, something like that, at least 8 to 12 we need to do. And uh, since these are inept based sequence, so we have to also look at um, what is the typical uh, inept sequence. So, you can say you set the time delay uh, which is here, which is here tau, it is at 2.7 millisecond. Okay. Right, so that that is what we set essentially and then we set the carrier frequency. So, in proton dimension it should be set at 4.7 ppm or something around that at water. The N15 dimension you have to set it somewhere in between. So, if we are doing at 100 to 130 we typically set at 115 or something like that 118, 115. Now, you acquire the data, so like minimum should be 128 complex point in T1 and for proton it can be 1 1k like 1024 T2 points. You can also record with this as a 256, here you can record at a 256 and this is fine or you can record at a 2, uh, 2k. Right, so that is a typical um, parameters that we are using. So, as we said we are recording 8 to 12 2D points. So, here is a representation of 2D we are recording and with a different time point different T1 delay the signal is going to change. Right, So, essentially we start with a minus inverted signal then little bit less little bit less and, and that is how it is in 1D that is what we see right it goes something like this. But in 2D the signal is going to decrease decay as we increase the T1 point. So, we record this data the 2D data and then do the two Fourier transform for each of these 2D data. And uh, before doing Fourier transform we just uh, do the usual stuff like a multiplying with a 90 degree shift square sine bell function or cosine bell function or Gaussian whatever you fit it then you zero fill at least twice of the digital resolution. So, you can zero fill up to 2k and 1k or 512 and 2k, 2k in, in direct dimension, indirect dimension 512. So, that digital resolution is typically up 2 hertz per point and then you can apply a 90 degree pulse on proton dimension also on nitrogen dimension. Um, zero field is required before Fourier transform. If required you can do linear prediction that improves the digital resolution, but all the time it may not be required. So, you can take a call whether you want to have a linear prediction or not. So, these are cosmetics or processing data processing once you have processed data remember all 2D like whatever 8 or 10 2D we are recording they should be identi identically processed right. So, for measuring the intensity. So, once we process identically using these stops right. So, typically if you open a Bruker um, top spin um, that is what I have taken from this is the zero filling you can do up to 5248, 512 this is the frequency that you can for like spectrometer frequency the SR values then window function what we want cosine or sine line broadening what is the SSB you can choose all of these parameters that you need phase correction value <coughs> now BC mode right all of these you can choose it whatever is needed for data processing getting a nicer well separated peaks because you cannot measure confidently intensity of the peaks which are merge something like this. Right. So, you need to process so that all peaks are very well separated and one can only take well separated peak for data analysis. Right. So, we create this series of 8 or 10 or 12 2D then for each peak now we are going to measure the intensity. So, series of uh, each series of these spectra is phase corrected. Right. And then proton dimension is adjusted according to the first FID phase or dimension like a phase of the N15 phase is here that phase is corrected here. So, phase you have to correct for the both dimension phase is corrected. Now, essentially we are measuring the amplitude of cross peaks or we can measure the volume integral of each peaks and <coughs> signal should not be overlapped right. So, you need to have that is what I was mentioning you need to have 
all separated signal in the 2D for the data analysis. We measure the volume integral or intensity integral say i j at any point uh, any t point that is a 2 millisecond, 5 millisecond, 500 millisecond. So, all those intensity are measured and that is fitted in a equation to measure the longitudinal relaxation is uh, relaxation time constant by fitting the equation. So, what is the equation that we are fitting? Essentially, this is the equation that we had discussed earlier, right. So, this equation essentially we are fitting to get the T1 parameter. So, this equation 1 minus 2 e to the power T divided, um, divided by T1 or multiplied with R1. So, rate or time we can measure it. So, if you measure it for say various amino acid that I am showing from one of the protein work. So, here for leucine um, sorry leucine 24, phenylalanine 36, lysine 46, you see with the T1 time which is varying from 0 100 to say 1.2 millisecond intensity is plotted and you can see with the time this intensity decrease and that is what we are going to fit into this equation uh, that we were saying T by T1. So, we fit this equation and find the T1 time or, or the R1 rate that is coming, right. So, this fitting we can do residue specific manner, all non-overlapping residues should be used for this fitting. Once we fit it, we can get the T1 relaxation rate for each of the amino acid and now one can plot it in a residue specific manner. So, here I am showing you a protein which is called human sumo that I, I had worked on. Now, this protein has a globular domain which is here, it has a similar fold like a ubiquitin beta beta alpha beta beta alpha fold and it has a long end terminus tail of about 20 amino acid and short. Uh, C terminal still of about 4 to 5 amino acid. There are loops here. So, now we are like I am going to discuss the T1 data that we have recorded for this protein. So, here is the residue specific manner plotting of this data. What we see here, right? So, in initially the T1 of these 20 amino acid shows higher value. Now, for all the well folded region alpha helix beta sheet or so, we are seeing the uh, sorry this is the R 1 value 1 by T 1. So, 1 by T 1 is R 1. So, relaxation rate for the flexible domain is higher, for well, well folded domain is lower. That means, the T 1 value for this is going to be shorter and for this is going to be longer. So, T 1 and R 1 has an inverse relation. If you look at all the flexible portion has a high relaxation rate, uh, longitudinal relaxation rate, again loops here which connects the two beta from here and some of the C termini again have high, here loops are high. So, all the loops you can see shows high longitudinal relaxation rate and all well structured uh, domain in this protein whether it is alpha helix or beta sheet shows relatively less relaxation like a longitudinal relaxation rate. Now, suppose I put this protein in urea where all measure of the secondary structure is removed. So, suppose I am doing the same experiment in 8 molar urea which denatures the protein. So, now the typically alpha helix beta sheets all the are all, all of those are gone and now you see what the rates are changing. So, if you look at here residue specific manner 0 to 100, what we see here that more or less it becomes flat. So, whatever you see sequence wise variation here when the protein is folded if you denature the relaxation rate is gone. So, if we measure the T1 relaxation rate of a protein it tells the motion in a residue specific manner the longitudinal relaxation rate in a residue specific manner and you see if we remove the structural um, elements from the protein this T1 relaxation rate becomes majorly uh, flat that means all the relaxation sequence wise variation that we were getting is becoming 
absolutely similar. Good, so that was about longitudinal relaxation rate which is called spin lattice relaxation rate. Now coming back to another relaxation rate which is called transverse relaxation rate, the T2 relaxation rate, T2 or T1 rho, the, uh, the T1 in, in a rotating frame are more or less similar, I will just discuss the T1. So what is, how we can measure the, sorry, we just discussed the T2, how we measure the transverse relaxation rate. Okay. So, the sequence of T2 uh, was initially developed by Ferro et al. Um, that I am going to show you in the next slide. It is similar to T1, essentially it is similar to T1 instead of creating a, <coughs> a, a minus z direction right, by applying of 180 degree pulse, here we create a coherence. So, here we inversion scheme is replaced by a CPMG or a spin lock sequence, CPMG in case of R2 and a spin lock in case of T1 rho. So, this rather than like here in T1 what we saw, our magnetization started with minus z direction and it went back to the plus z direction. Now, in this case we are starting with a transverse relaxation rate. So, rather than decaying along the longitudinal relaxation, the heteronuclear magnetization relax in the transverse plane during this uh, the, during this time t in the t 2 pulse sequence. So, here we are not going like this, here just by applying a 90 degree pulse or CPMG pulse we are coming in the transverse plane and from here now our spin is going back to the equilibrium state. Right? So, so, what contributes so in your addition to spin spin interaction right, because this is transverse relaxation rate is spin spin relaxation rate. So, other than the spin spin interaction the field homogeneity magnetic field in homogeneity also contributes to transverse relaxation rate. So, to remove this contribution coming from field homo homogeneity the CPMG spin echo sequence. Uh, which was developed by Carl Purcell, um, Mibum and Gill was introduced in the T2 scheme. So, CPMG scheme of heteronuclear magnetization, what happens here? We started with a SZ and by applying a 90 degree pulse we came to SX. So, SX evolved during this period of say epsilon under the interaction of chemical shift and field inhomogeneity. Then we apply a 90 degree pulse which reverse the direction of procession. So, we started with here, we went back here and now it is slowly dephasing and then we apply a 180 degree pulse. So, it goes like this and then slowly it dephases and then finally it refocus during the second period of eta. Right? So, first it dephases, then you apply it and then it come back. So, the provided the spin being refocused. Uh, remain in the identical magnetic field during this both period of epsilon. Right? So, so, then we can measure the rate. So, resulting transverse magnetization at the end of the even echo period of this CPMG, uh, CPMG pulse strain has an amplitude something like this I is a intensity at any time point and I0 is the initial intensity. Now, T is the time period with which we have like waited for and R2 is the spin relaxation rate. Okay. So, that is what uh, we measure basically for the T. So, now T is 2 n 2 eta that time that we are discussing pulse width of 180 degree pulse. So, that is a CPMG pulse strain that we are measuring and essentially we are measuring again intensity during the T2 period. So, this is our pulse sequence that we are using. We have started in a with a inept block, we are coming back to here nitrogen. Then you can see here we are introducing the CPMG pulse and during this the T2 relaxation is happening. Then we are frequency encoding going back to proton, detecting on proton while decoupling the nitrogen. So, this is the T period during which transverse relaxation is happening and that is happening on nitrogen uh, nuclei. So, that is what we measure. So, again we record some 8 to 12 of 2D with different T2 time, the Fourier transform them, process them and then 
and we measure the intensity in a residue specific manner as we did for T1 and you can get the T2 rate. So, here typically the duration that we keep is 0 to about 200 millisecond. So, here you can see for different residue like Q53, um, 25K that lysine and uh, K25 that is lysine and I solution 88. Here the signal intensity decay are measured. Okay. So, now each of this fitting gives us a rate of a particular N50 nuclei. So, data processing is done, done in a similar manner typically 8 to 12 uh, relaxation delay ranging from 5 millisecond to 150 millisecond is, is, is uh, recorded and uh, data processing similar like T1. So, if you do that and plot in a residue specific manner, now what we get is this one. So, here this is the again rate. So, here the for the flexible portion we are getting the less R2 value whereas, all the structured portion we are getting more R2 value. This remember this is spin spin relaxation. Now, this was slightly different in case of T1 here if you look at this is reverse here for the flexible portion we are getting the higher R1 rate lower R2 value. For the structured portion we are getting typically lower R1 value, but higher R2 value. So, this is the typical signature we get again at the end you see the lower R2 values are there. Now, some of these peaks are also showing the high value. The one contribution because R2 consists of R2 intrinsic plus Rex. Now, this is exchange phenomena. So, R2 also encodes the exchange chemical exchange that is happening. For doing that you require a, 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 a like a relaxation dispersion experiment, but looking at this you can say that this protein is geared to show some chemical exchange which needs to be further probed. So, I am not going in detail of the, the REX at the moment, but that information is hidden there. Now, similarly if you if you look at the denatured protein again if you put this sumo protein in 8 molar urea you can see similar like R1 the R2 becomes also flat. So, all exchange are suppressed all the sequence wise variation is suppressed. So, here is the folded protein in 0 molar urea R2 and for ready reference I am also showing in denatured state. So, everything is suppressed now protein behaves quite uniformly because earlier it was quite folded and when you put in 8 molar urea it become uh, like a disorder right. So, here 8 molar this is 0 molar. So, just to show that the dynamics that we are measuring also tells a lot about structural compaction where is the flexibility where is the rigidity. So, not only structure, but also NMR can prove dynamic in a residue specific manner. Now, you can even use this concept for protein folding study. So, here I show you how sick like a urea concentration wise R2 changing. So, 8 molar urea you have a more or less flat, but when you reduce the urea you see some central portion is coming up like it, it has a this profile. If you go to 5 molar it has this profile. So, all the central portion where a structure was supposed to be there basically building up and that is how measuring the R2 dynamics also tells about what is the folding hot spot where the structure is forming and that is what you can measure it in a residue specific manner to understand the protein folding. So, with this I just want to summarize today R1 and R2 are two basic experiment that are done for the uh, protein NMR. Next class I am also going to discuss about heteronuclear NOE. R1 measures the longitudinal relaxation rate, R2 measures the spin relaxation rate and uh, they, they are for the folded region and there is a like a uh, for the folded region there will be low R1 high R2 for like a disorder region or the flexible portion it will have high R1 low R2 right. So, and R2 can be used to monitor the structure that could be formed during the protein folding that is what uh, I am showing you here. So, with this I am going to close it today and in the next class we can take heteronuclear NOE and how we can combine all these basic experiment of protein, protein NMR T1, T2 and NOE R1, R2 or NOE to, uh, to, to deduce 
reduce spectral density function or even modal free. Okay. So, with this I am closing it here for today, see you in the next class, thank you very much.